within the traditions of the West, it seems that the study of demonization with or without using the word surfaces whenever humanity looks at its very own atrocities. Unfortunately, most of the times by looking back. The question that drives this handbook is this, how can one make sense of dehumanization across disciplinary boundaries of the humanities and the social sciences? Understanding the human and dehumanization as its corollary were contingent, responding to particular experiences and developing within the patterns of thought offered by the historicization of nature, the naturalization of man and the temporalization of human difference. Contingency is a central consideration, not only in regard to substance, but also in regard to approach. Whether the crossing of the animal human boundary via classification criteria resulted in a vision of humanity that is inclusive of all humans, or whether it excluded and dehumanized some, was at all times highly context dependent. In order to defend the humanity of slaved Africans, British abolitionists thought it necessary to, I quote, completely overthrow the orangutan system. Enlightenment debates on the orangutan left the modern human sciences an epistemological doubt about the definition of humankind and its boundaries. This had significant consequences for the ways in which the human-animal divide and the race question shaped the debate on humanization and dehumanization in the West. This chapter contends that a longer chronology provides a more nuanced understanding of the persistent problem in conceptualizing humanity. In the Western world, the emerging leisure and mass entertainment society from the mid-19th century until after the Second World War regularly practiced the exhibition of alien living human beings. Exotic peoples were placed under the gaze of the Western white spectators in the great exhibitions, world fairs and zoological gardens as representatives of lower and dominated races. It has been a shameful, long-lasting side effect of the age of imperialism and a Western claim to world domination. But on closer inspection, our contemporary society of mass entertainment and scientific popularization has never stopped commercializing human beings by exhibiting them in spectacles and reality shows. To sum up, my outline of two competing strands of anthropology in early 20th century Germany demonstrates that the key motives of Nazi anthropology were well embedded in the broader historical context. Both examples show that the concepts of humanity that grounded the dehumanizing strategies of Nazi ideology were prevalent in the scholarly debates of the time. The case of National Socialism thus exemplifies the dehumanizing potential of anthropological theories. We can identify a terminological shift from zoomorphism to biological determinism in the 1970s that then consolidated in the 1980s with dehumanization. Each phrase cast a broader historical net iteratively conjoining male violence with the sexualization of women, the processes of racialization, and finally, the numbing effects of modern technology. As a concept, dehumanization captured all of these meanings, formally linking the reduction of humanity to animality as parallel to the degradation of humans as machines. Psychological studies conducted under the rubric of dehumanization may now be assessing whether humans are explicitly likened to apes, rated as lacking certain human emotions, but not others, unconsciously associated with inanimate objects, or less likely to evoke strong reactions in the posterior cingulate cortex, according to fMRI scans. They may be investigating virulent racial propaganda, attitudes to political opponents, or patronizing perceptions of spouses. It can reasonably be asked whether the phenomena currently collected under the umbrella of dehumanization have more differences than similarities how the differences might be systematized in future research, and whether the similarities are sufficient 
to allow generalizations about dehumanization singular rather than dehumanizations plural. Because they are not humans, not fully human, deficient humans, or subhumans, dehumanized individuals can be harmed in a way that is not permissible with human beings or with full humans. That is, when people deliberate about what can be done to others, dehumanized individuals do not figure in their deliberations the way fully human individuals do. They are deprived of their moral standing. Far from simply providing indifferent hooks on which to hang oppressive ideologies, human-animal normative hierarchies actively set the stage for the ideologies, inflicting on animals violence of the very sort that hierarchical thinking prepares us to inflict on human beings. What I'm really interested in in that chapter is in getting people to think a little bit more about the question of whether there's an intrinsic connection between eugenics and dehumanization, given the historical legacy uh, of eugenics, uh, particularly through Nazi eugenics and other extreme forms of dehumanization. And what I invite people to think about uh, partly here are the roles that we have in the professional community of bioethicists and philosophers in addressing issues around disability in ways that uh, avoid the eugenic echoes of the past. From a common sense perspective, the nexus between dehumanization and human rights is self-explanatory. Where the former occurs, the latter will suffer. There are, however, a number of questions that are worth raising from a philosophical perspective. Dehumanization by law consists in legally violating legal certainty and equality, in legally bringing about a condition of arbitrariness and inequality, and in legally infringing on someone or groups of people in their status of a full juridical person, making it possible to treat the victim or victims as subhuman. Dehumanization by law is a topic with which lawyers and legal philosophers are never done, for it confronts them with a burden on their actions as well as on their thinking. Perpetrators of dehumanization do not necessarily break the laws that are in place, and it would be difficult to put such a perfect legal system into practice that could be applied to all shades of dehumanizing behavior that are morally objectionable. Literature, I argue, has the singular ability to reveal and to put on stage this unbridgeable gap between ethics and the law. The absence of legal transgression and the parallel presence of moral transgression in the most ordinary processes of dehumanization. Racism as societalization by dehumanization is a social relation that allows even the lowest member of society the imagination of belonging to a community in contrast to completely alienated others. The communality of the unequals produces Untermenschen. Dehumanization comes in systematically different forms. The stereotypically warm but incompetent elder is dehumanized in a different way from the stereotypically competent but cold Jewish person or Asian person. And all these differ from dehumanizing a homeless person who is seen as neither warm nor competent. A reorientation of the research focus in dehumanization is urgently needed to be initiated in order to explore how dehumanization impacts targets and to unveiling the other side of the dehumanization process. Dehumanization may provide the ultimate answer to the public's uncertainty about refugees' rights and our obligations to protect and assist them. After all, if refugees are not quite human, they're not necessarily worthy of the human rights and humane treatment to which all human beings should be entitled. We have the desire to create a mechanical and autonomous agent that is human enough to fulfill our social and relational needs. On the other hand, these same agents elicit fear when they become too human, blurring the differences between humans and machines. 
In other words, that what turns our hope for this technology into concern is its humanization, the level of similarity of robots with humans. Frantz Fanon uses the phrase epidermalization of inferiority to describe the process of negative qualities becoming habitually entangled with perceptions of skin colour. Being repeatedly exposed to inferiorizing and racializing reactions to one's bodily presence leads to the terrifying and alienating realization that one's visibility to others is unrecognizably deformed. But Fanon is not the only phenomenologist who analyzes a concrete variety of dehumanizing engagement. Simone de Beauvoir's argument is not just that men project their mortality onto women, but more generally they tend to project everything that they cannot accept as fundamentally limiting their self-governed actions and volitions. Thus, women's bodies become for them locations of passivity, animality, carnality and death. My contribution to this um, book is a chapter that argues uh, dehumanization is one thing, um, but objectification is something else. Scholars of hatred and dehumanization should take care not to proceed as if all haters are mad, bad or dangerous dehumanizers. For hatred can, despite its dangerous dehumanizing potentials, be part of a morally permissible or even virtuous response to dehumanization. Thomas and I argue against several reductive conceptions of dehumanization, against restricting dehumanization to the complete denial of the victim's humanity, against separating dehumanization entirely from moral emotions and motivations, and against limiting dehumanization to psychological processes in the minds of the perpetrators. There is no record of what the men who dismembered Sam Hose's body thought about him, and no record of what went on in the spectators' minds as they watched him suffer and die. But we do have records of how Hose was described in the Southern press. He was called a fiend incarnate, a monster in human form, a black brute whose carnival of blood and lust has brought death and desolation, and a fiendish beast. And there is no doubt that the removal of black men's body parts as trophies and the practice of referring to their ceremonial burning as barbecues comports with an image of them as subhuman animals. As these facts attest, the black image in the white mind oscillated between the human, the animal, and the monsters. Dehumanization is a cognitive mechanism for managing difference and similarity, closeness and distance. It is not necessarily one of discounting or negating variation so that distinct boundaries between groups can be utilized. Shades of being human are enough, unfortunately, to dehumanize.